us to, to change. Help us draw near to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Have you found yourself in a moment, have you ever had an experience where you were, you knew you were in the presence of just, of, of beauty, or uh, you were experiencing something that was so amazing that everyone, everyone else around you should, should also be acknowledging what you are experiencing. You, th- you think about majestic beauties like the Grand Canyon or thinking about being on top of Mount Everest or seeing the Northern Lights and you see, and these are just amazing things that majority of people acknowledge that these, this is beautiful and wonderful. You ever been around in a situation where you're seeing these things but you see others who are just not affected by it at all? I must admit that this week there was something that happened in the in, in the world that hasn't ha- or in North America that hasn't happened since 2017 and that was the total solar eclipse. And I was looking up social media and I was at I was just looking up news sites and people were preparing for the the total solar eclipse and I was like okay how can I prepare for this eclipse and I was not prepared and Alyssa and I were wanting to educate our kids and get them excited on the solar eclipse, but thus realizing that we weren't really excited ourselves. Therefore, it really didn't affect us in a way that that other people were amazed. A better example of this was when um, I was able to experience something more rare than a total eclipse on January 22nd, 2006. I was at this place called, at the time, the Staples Center. Have you heard of it? And something more rare happened on that day. There was a man who scored 81 points. This man was Kobe Bryant. Shout out to Danny taking me to the game and some other friends. He took us and some other friends to this game, and he, he took this other friend of ours, this, we're not going to say her name, but you know, she, she didn't really have an appreciation for basketball or what, so we took her, we took her, and she was able to witness greatness, witness this amazing thing that happened. Only one other person has scored more than 80 points in an NBA game. So afterwards, we're like, all right, so how was it for you? Nothing, you know, just, it's just a regular day for her. It was a regular Sunday for her. I think it was on a Sunday when we went. She saw something as amazing as an 81-point game and something so rare, but there was no effect on her. It's kind of what our text is alluding to in John 3. Jesus comes to the world, the most rarest of miracles one can ever experience, which is God now living amongst man. The people were living amongst greatness. But what were the people's response? Look at John 3, verses 19 to 20. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it, so that his deeds may not be exposed. So we're going to focus on two questions. What happened? And what was the result? And when we go over the results, there's going to be two results, okay? Well, um, after that, then we'll focus on a specific takeaway that I want for us to think about in the text. A little caveat, I initially thought PJ was going to preach on Jonah 1, so uh, there may be some Jonah references here that, you know, if you know, hopefully you guys know a little bit about Jonah's story, it'll be helpful for the text. So a little background on, in John, on John 3. Jesus is having a conversation late at night with a man named Nicodemus. Sorry, I was distracted by Anna. Peter was distracted by Anna right now, uh, <laughs> earlier. But Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. He is one who comes with the best of credentials at the time. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. 
a highly regarded teacher of Israel. Yet Nicodemus is so captivated by Jesus, and who can blame him? There is something about Jesus' teaching to Nicodemus that although it seemed so contrary to what he believed, he just kept listening. This is, so this is who Jesus is talking to here. So let's focus on the first question. What happened? What happened is the first part of verse 19. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The light has come into the world. Who's Jesus talking about here? Himself. He is the light of the world that has come into the world. You see, the Son of Man came into an already lost and condemned world. This world that he's coming into was not neutral towards him. They hated him. And Jesus came to this world to provide salvation to a people needing salvation. The people were in the presence of greatness. They were in the presence of beauty and majesty. They were staring at the face of God. You see, church, when Christ, the light of the world, comes to shine on a person's life, it either breaks him and leads that person to repentance and faith, or it, even, or it contributes even more to their darkness. And this leads us to our second question. What was the result? And the first result is that they lo- the people loved darkness because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. Jesus says that the people, when the light of the world came, they loved the darkness rather than the light. When he came proclaiming God's goodness and being the radiance of God's glory, they rejected him. They rejected the light and they wanted to stay in their darkness because, well, because why? They loved their evil deeds. You see, like the, like the bright light of the sun, after you haven't gotten much sleep, for those in darkness, the light of Christ hurts your eyes. Seeing Christ revealed to them of their own wickedness, it thoroughly made them uncomfortable. You see, Jesus isn't saying these things to the people because some, pe- some people's evil deeds are more pe- evil than others. Therefore, they're condemned. But it is because they chose to live in the darkness and reject him. These people who live in darkness, these are the people that would sh- shut the door on Jesus. They would close their drapes. They would shut the curtains. They would shut themselves in into their own darkness. They have cut themselves off from the light. They love their evil deeds and they have no wish to be disturbed in their wrongdoing. They refuse to be shaken out of their comfortable sinfulness. You see, our text here says that they avoided the light. They avoided Christ. They avoided exposure to him. They hid from him. They prefer the darkness and in that lies their condemnation. For them to see Jesus, to be in his presence, was just a reminder of their evil deeds. It was a reminder of what they would need to give up. And for them, it was not a choice they were willing to make. You see, church, Jesus is making the distinction here that those in the darkness are those who don't believe. So a result of Jesus, the light coming into the world, is that those who remain in the darkness avoided and hid from him because they wanted to remain in their evil deeds. So this is the first result. Those, when Jesus came, those who hit, those who, those who remained in the darkness didn't believe. The second result of the light of the world coming is pretty much implied in that, which is that it would draw, if the light of the world coming, it would draw others to belief in him. It would draw others to belief in him. But let's not make the mistake here to think that so, since you don't do evil deeds, you are not in the darkness. Just because you don't think you do evil deeds doesn't mean you are in the light. Or just because you do good deeds means you're in the light. You see, if there was anyone to boast on their good deeds, you know who it was? It was Nicodemus. 
Anyone who had thought they were good and would inherit the kingdom of God, it was Nicodemus. He, he, Nicodemus likely thought that his place was secure in the kingdom of God, virtue of his race, virtue of his circumcision, virtue of the things that he's done. Yet he finds out that in Jesus' kingdom, his good deeds do not determine whether he will inherit this kingdom. Friends, your good deeds doesn't mean you inherit the kingdom of heaven. Calling yourself a Christian doesn't mean you inherit the kingdom of heaven. Being a member at BBC doesn't mean you inherit the kingdom of heaven. So how does one come to the light if not through their good deeds? Look one verse down in verse 21. It says here, but anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. So who accomplishes the work? God. You see, the contrast between one in darkness and one in light, the unbeliever and the believer, is not that one hates the light and the other loves it. The ultimate reason why the believer comes to faith in God is because of God. Because God drew that person out of their darkness and into his marvelous light. You see, those in the light do not dance and show off their good deeds out of arrogant self-righteousness. But they come to Christ so that it would be made known that what has been done in their lives has been done through God. So as Christians, why are we okay being out in the open with our sins being exposed in the light? And it's not like... Like, as Christians, we're these people who all of a sudden just love airing our, all of our dirty laundry, airing all of our business to everyone, right? It's still an un uncomfortable process. Why do, we, why do we do these things? Why do we encourage each other to continually repent and confess sin and ask God and others for forgiveness? Because we ultimately know that God has drawn us to himself to save us. Verse 17, a verse before our text. Actually, two verses before our text. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So these are the results of Christ coming, of the light coming. You are either drawn to Christ, which would lead to repentance and faith, or the beauty of Christ being around such greatness would draw you away because you love your evil deeds. So BBC, most of you here, I mean, as members, of, members of BBC, you guys profess faith in Christ. You don't identify with the darkness. You would identify yourself as those following Christ or in the light. But a question I want to pose to you and a takeaway that I want you guys to maybe think about today and even before we take the Lord's Supper is where in, your, where in your life are you still hiding in the darkness? Where in your, li in your life do you still love the darkness? We as believers may not think that we love darkness or resonate with that, but are there aspects in your life where you're hiding from God. Similar to, to Jonah and Jonah 1, deciding to flee from him and hide from him. Is there sin in your life that you are keeping from others? Is there sin that you are not confessing that you're either holding on to because you love it or afraid of what ha would happen if people knew about it? Are there things you're holding on to instead of entrusting them to the Lord? Are there areas of your life where you're holding on to jealousy or greed? Are there areas where instead of showing humility, you're internally self-righteous and prideful? Are there areas of your life where you need to surrender to the Lord and lose tightly to the grip of control? I don't know if you're like me, but my struggle isn't necessarily a desire to love evil and hide in darkness. 
But there are situations where I feel a lack of trust in God's plan. Where there is a desire to run from him. There is a temptation to desire different circumstances, different trials than the ones, I'd ra- the ones, the ones that I, I, I'm in now, to not want to be in the place where God has placed me now. I'll tell myself, God, I know you work all things out for your good and your plan is good, but I really wish the current trials you've put me in didn't happen. Or they're not here. God, I really don't know what you're trying to do here. I don't think it's right. Like Jonah, knowing that God would accomplish his purposes with the Ninevites, but not desiring for God to use him in reaching them. Where are you hiding and fleeing from God? Church, bring these thoughts out of the darkness and into the light. Bring it to the light. Because here's the thing. God already knows. Allow others to speak light into your darkness. You see, it's a scary thought to think that there is someone who knows you truly and fully. But in Christ, you're fully known. And similar to Jonah, you may want to flee. You may want to hide from God for some reason or another. But friends, let me encourage you with this. You can't hide from him. You can't hide from him. And more importantly, God knows that even in your hiding, the solution to your hiding is actually resting in him. By trusting him. He is what your aching heart needs. He is the one who is walking with you, comforting you, and he is leading you and guiding you. Don't run from God like Jonah. Consider Simon Peter in John 6 when some of the followers of Jesus were discouraged at at how hard Jesus' teaching was and they left him. Jesus asked his 12, you don't want to go away, do you? You don't want to go away too, do you? What's, What's Peter's response? Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So friends, you can't hide from God. Think about where in ways you're not surrendering and entrust it to him. If you're not a Christian here today, thank you for being here. My encouragement to you is that you don't have to keep hiding from God either. And your darkness is not too powerful for the light of God's love to penetrate and change you. You see, Jesus, the light, the son of God, the radiance of God's glory came into a lost and hopeless and dark world. He came so that you who are blinded by the darkness and evil in your life would have your eyes opened by the wonders of his love. Jesus would take upon himself the dark, your darkness, our darkness, by dying on the cross for our sins. He takes on the full wrath of God that we deserve and the penalty that should have been bestowed on us. And Jesus shows his power over the darkness when he rose again from the dead. And he is calling you now to the light and to life in him. He is offering you eternal life if you repent of your sins and not just your evil deeds, but also any ounce of your own goodness that you think will save you. And he wants you to trust him, to give your life to him. And there will will never be a day where you will regret this decision. If you want to talk more about the gospel message, you can find me after the sermon or any of the other, or you can talk to any of the members here. So friends, as we close, the light of the world came to not condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In whatever season you're in, God is drawing you now to the light of the gospel. So think about ways you may be hiding from him, fleeing from him, and not entrusting it to him, and encourage you, let it be shown in the light. As I was preparing this uh, devotional, 
on meditating on the text, there was a song that was actually very encouraging to me. So I wanted to share it. It's kind of ironic because it's not a Christian song. It's a R&B song. So uh, just uh, bear with the lyrics a little bit. But hopefully it can be helpful for you as you think about the text. It says, I don't know if you are familiar with Bob, Bobby Caldwell. I see you in the lonely place. How can you be so lost? You're still regretting the love you left, left behind. Oh, darling, I've seen you go through these changes, sitting alone each night. Are you expecting to find a love, a love that's right? So, darling, open your eyes and let me show you the light. Girl, you'll never find a love that's right. So, darling, open your eyes and let me show you the light. So, friends, BBC, there is a light that shines that's special for you and me, and his name is Jesus Christ. So don't run from him. Instead, open your eyes and let him show you the light. And trust me, you will never find a love that's right. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light so that we would see that the works were accomplished by you. You are the one who opened our blind eyes. You are the one who came into a world that was not, a world that hated you. And yet you worked in us where you were drawing us to yourself. We thank you, Lord. We pray that you would help us now consider where we are not entrusting certain things to you and let us surrender that to you. Help us to not hide, help us to not flee, help us to rest in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.